Hello everyone and welcome to The Vortex, where lies and falsehoods are trapped and exposed. I'm Michael Vortz. It's an unfolding tragedy in the church that isn't getting a lot of airtime, but more and more frequently, priests persecuted by their bishops as well as lay people are having to turn to secular courts for justice. Various priests are lawyering up to try and fend off attacks from their bishops, but just as much as various groups of laity getting no justice at all from their bishops are also turning to secular judges. For many years, courts would not hear cases from internal fights in the church owing to a lack of desire to embroil the civil courts in what were seen as church matters. Dishonest bishops and their legal teams capitalized on that and had legitimate cases tossed out of court left and right, arguing about separation of church and state. But that is beginning to change as laity, even now, are having to turn to courts for justice. A couple of weeks ago, a class action suit was filed against the U.S. Bishops' Conference for fraud, taking hundreds of millions of dollars over the years from faithful for the Peters Pence collection, presenting it as a collection for the poor, when in reality the vast majority of the money went to paying off increasing Vatican debts. Now, just last week, in the continuing evil of the case of the Archdiocese of Detroit and its Archbishop Alan Bigneron trying to destroy the good priest Father Edward Perrone, parishioners, the people sitting in the pews, actually had to file suit against Vigneron, their bishop, and his archdiocese in an attempt to get justice. The lawsuit neatly and concisely spells out every detail of what has been going on inside that wicked chancery for the past 18 months regarding this case. We've attached the entire filing against Vigneron's only a few pages and his cronies so you can read the entire matter for yourself. And we highly suggest taking the few minutes to read it for yourself because it lays out every last sordid detail that Vigneron has allowed to go on here. But here are some of the most important takeaways. Recall that Church Milton has known the identity of the supposed accuser for weeks before any of this became public. And what's most important, that Vigneron and his archdiocese did not know that we knew. So in their minds, no one knew the truth of the matter, so they mistakenly thought they could say whatever they wanted to and get away with it. Wrong. Knowing who the supposed accuser was before the story became public gave us here at Church Militant the opportunity to vet the claims of Vigneron and the archdiocese against Father Perone. And those claims were completely bogus, and Vigneron and his hitman, Monsignor Michael Bugarin, knew they were bogus. In fact, Bugarin actually helped manufacture the claims, bullying the accuser into saying things that were not true. Here is at least one pertinent excerpt, quote, Bugarin twisted John Doe's allegations and fabricated a rape charge against Father Perone in order to force the AOD to remove Father Perone and thereby shield the AOD and Bugarin from a negative AP story, closed quote. Now the backstory you need to know here is that the supposed victim's wife, fed up with her marriage and wanting to divorce, is the one who called the AOD and made the allegation in order to get some money from the church before seeking a divorce. The Associated Press was tipped off and when they got in touch with the AOD, Vigneron, in order to make it look like the AOD was not ignoring a charge of sexual assault, set this whole sordid wicked plot in motion. Bugarin interviewed the supposed victim. Now, you also need to know that the man himself, the supposed victim, has a number of professionally diagnosed psychological illnesses which have prevented him from working for close to 20 years, and he's on a pretty heavy-duty regimen of psychotropic drugs for it. As an aside, those close to the supposed victim tell Church Milton that this was in large part responsible for his wife wanting divorce. Now, once the AP got involved, Bugarin, with Vigneron's approval, went to work trying to get the victim to level a charge of rape against Father Perone, emotionally manipulating him in the process. But the victim, time and time again, refused to make that accusation. Immediately after his wife called, and in the climate, remember, of the Pennsylvania grand, ju grand jury report hanging in the air, the AOD's investigator went to the accuser, who said he did not want to go public with anything. 
The AOD disregarded his wishes and went to the county sheriff and got one of Bugarin's parishioners to work the case. Nancy LePage worked for the sheriff's department and was a parishioner of Bugarin both at the same time. Together, Vigneron's hitman and, very important, a publicly paid law enforcement officer kept coming back to the supposed accuser and trying to coerce some kind of damning statement from him about Father Perone. Eventually, LePage's summary of what she thought was flat out rejected by her superiors as having no merit at all. It was full of holes from top to bottom. She essentially created accusations by implication and attributed them to the supposed victim, all under the watchful eye of Monsignor Michael Bugarin, whose main interest was getting Father Perone so that the AOD would not look like it was ignoring victims. In the process, he and Vigneron created many more victims, not the least of which was emotionally brutalizing a psychologically disturbed man, throwing Father Perone under the bus and placing a cloud over the entire parish of Assumption Grotto. LePage, Bugarin's parishionary member, routinely destroyed all her notes after each interview and merely produced summaries. In one telling revelation from the lawsuit, quote, LePage falsely reported that John Doe claimed Father Perone had sodomized him, closed quote. LePage included that claim in her official report, even though the victim himself flat out denied it. Again, we urge you strongly to read the filing for yourself. Church Milton has been saying for years that operational control of the church has been seized by weak, cowardly men, many of whom also happen to be homosexual. These wicked, self-interested men have no love of anything or anyone except themselves and their own personal agendas. They steal from the people. They lie to them. They throw their own clergy under the bus. They endanger the spiritual welfare of the laity and do not care about anything spiritual. Detroit, under Archbishop Alan Vigneron, is a prime example of this. He has permitted this filth to continue. He has done nothing to put a stop to it, thus revealing his true identity. Two years ago, owing to many factors, church militant called on Archbishop Vigneron to step down to resign. And that was before all of this latest garbage. But far from being viewed as unfit, his fellow faithless cohort at the USCCB actually voted him second in command, vice president of their conference, which usually means he would ascend to the presidency three years from now. Has anyone at the USCCB picked up the phone and said, hey, Alan, what the hell is going on with this case? If they haven't, shame on them. Like so many other bishops in the U.S., Vigneron is unfit for his high office, period. And all this while he has the gall to ask the people here in Detroit for $200 million so the archdiocese can fulfill its mission. This man has to go, and so does Bugarin. Bugarin should be defrocked for the evil he has perpetrated against a fellow priest. He knew these charges he leveled were a pack of lies, created out of thin air by him and a parishioner who worked for law enforcement. What they didn't count on was church militant knowing the actual truth of the story because we knew the supposed victim, and after we dug around, we discovered the whole thing was in fact a pack of lies. All the faithful want is justice but you can't get justice from confirmed liars and wicked men, especially ones pretending they believe the faith. No one who acts like this and still to this day sticks to their guns and continues this vile persecution can possibly believe the faith. The church for them is a money-making institution that must be protected at all costs, and that's all it is to them. Church Militant will soon be notifying the papal nuncio in Washington, D.C. of the real truth of this matter, as well as notifying the Congregation for Bishops in Rome, and we will be asking each of them for the removal of Vigneron, as well as a purging of his chancery. We will also be in touch with the USCCB, asking them to nullify last November's vote in which Vigneron was elected Vice President. When we put all of this in order, we will be reaching out to you to sign a petition asking for the same. This evil has to stop, all of it, and this case is just one of many, but the laity have to start somewhere. 
Detroit was the historical center of the storm back in the late 60s and 70s under the reign of Cardinal John Dearden. Vigneron was ordained by that modernist prelate. It seems altogether fitting that the strike back against this modernist filth should commence in the same archdiocese where it all began. God love you. I'm Michael Voris.